and uh, and we'll get started with the first of two polls. This is the way we usually do it. This helps us understand who our audience is. This, you could just take a second. I'd like you to select one item in the first part and only one item in the second part. So, start. The top and work your way down and pick the first. First one that's correct. We'll do this for just, we'll at least take just a few seconds to. do. They're very helpful for us. I tabulate all this information and then I can use this when I need to talk to budget people here to make sure that they make the investments that they make. I think it was largely, or certainly it helped to have the activity that we've had in these webcasts each month. The Cornell just updated the version of this software. Okay, we have 14 of 21 people voting, or, or uh, responding rather to this. I keep saying voting. It's not really a vote. Responding to the survey. If we could get a few more people to join in. Okay, let's close this and tuck it away and bring up the second poll. And the same thing here, but you only vote once. 20 people. Okay, any more respondents? Okay, we'll close this and get it out of the way. And now I'll uh, get to the fun part. I'm going to introduce a friend and colleague, Jim Finley. Dr. Finley is at Penn State University, the, uh, the Pennsylvania State Extension Forester, uh, and does a lot of work with uh, forest management and forest owners and the sociology, deer, been involved with a lot of different projects. Today he's going to join us and we'll be talking about strategies for growing high quality hardwoods. Many of you have participated in these web conferences before. As you know, if you have questions, feel free to type those in as Jim's uh, going through Excuse the me. presentation. Um, good evening, will, folks. And thanks, Peter, for the and introduction and what have you. The opportunity to do those this. questions. Uh, I appreciate down Cornell so providing. We read them later this, uh, or he may respond for people to and for, for all of us. Uh, if you have a question, feel free to, to uh, earlier today put it into the chat the afternoon session. So with that, but I'll we're turn emulating Jim and welcome Cornell you to the evening to version of this kind of program conference. Here in Pennsylvania. And, uh, I think it's a wave of the future to try to uh, reduce our impacts by learning in different kinds of ways. And so I'm interested to see how this works, and I thank you for coming this evening. Um, what we're going to be talking about are strategies for growing high-quality hardwoods. To think about, one, we're talking about hardwoods. Our emphasis is going to be on hardwoods. Um, and when we're thinking about um, this, this concept, it's probably useful to spend some time thinking about what are the qualities of quality indicators. How do we know whether we're growing high-quality material? 
and then we'll segue from that uh, as the discussion develops into some management processes, eventually going into some silviculture and trying to understand decision processes we go through once we've decided what high quality is and how we're going to invest our, our resources, time, and money, and the site itself into trees. Uh, I borrowed the this idea that is per, per shown in this picture from Jim Steeler, who is the CFM coordinator in Pennsylvania. And it's the idea that when we're harvesting timber, we've got the best opportunity we're ever going to have to improve the quality of our forest. And on the other hand, we've got the best opportunity to, to cause significant damage to our forest. So understanding how to do it right with the right kinds of objectives and thinking through what accomplish is, is absolutely critical to try to move the forest towards sustainability and the values that on it. When we think about hardwood quality, um, there are a couple things that come to mind. I look at the trees and I look at the forest and one of the things that automatically comes to mind is the idea of species. So from our experience that certain species work with other species, uh, we've always got this market question, you know, what's going to be more valuable tomorrow? Uh, prices change, market demands change. Four years ago, red oak was worth a lot. Now red oak's down. Black cherry has begun to become depressed. Red maple has gone up. And all these kinds of things happen. The important thing is, I think, that when we look at species, we think about what we can grow on our site, which we'll come to. and and grow the best we can because quality, I think, is always going to have a marketplace. Size is a driving issue in this discussion because, as we'll see, size influences the, the value of saw timber, affects our ability to yield boards of high quality. So we need to think about that. Uh, Tim, am I not talking loud enough? Is the sound coming through OK? I'll try to be more careful with where the mic is. Um, so size is one thing. Surface is is the outside surface of the log, and trying to think about uh, how that surface condition affects the inside condition and ultimately responds to the quality of the wood we derive from. Certainly, we have to think about I can interior hear defects and. Um, uh, the, the interior defects, you know, affect our ability to mill the wood. Also, it affects our ability to influence sort of the, the circumference of clear wood that we have. Um, so, as we look at trees, you know, we got to think about a lot of things. And this particular tree, I think, represents a good image of quality. Nice black cherry. I have to admit that it's grown in Michigan rather than Pennsylvania. We have some that would equal that easily. Ultimately, when we're looking at the quality of saw logs, hardwood trees, we've got to think about the idea that it comes down to boards. Unlike softwoods, which are graded on structural strength, hardwood boards are graded on appearance. And so people are willing to pay a premium clear lumber without defects, the kinds of things that we associate with knots, bark inclusions, checks, cracks bird pecks and those kinds of things. And so as we're looking at a tree standing in the woods, we have to be able to interpret into the tree how those defects will show up in lumber. And and I think it's useful for anyone who's interested in growing hardwood trees for quality to spend time in a sawmill. Go to a sawmill, preferably it's one where they leave the bark on and you can see how the log opens with bark on it. But most production mills now debark, and so you have to sort of begin to understand as you watch the debark or how that interprets into surface defects on the log, and then ultimately how it works. There's a parallel between hardwood lumber grades and, and hardwood log grades. The, the better quality log grades, which are generally called factory log grade ones, are going to yield first and second lumber, which is the highest quality hardwood lumber. 
And as we look at lower log grades, we also start to look at lumber values coming out of it. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a couple slides. So when we're looking at hardwood logs in the tree, we have to start to think about a couple of things. One is the position of the log within the tree. And clearly the grades talk about the idea of butts and uppers. Butts being the lower logs, uppers being logs above them. And butt logs have smaller scaling diameters than upper logs. As we'll see, butt logs actually have, in theory, more clear wood accumulated on them than the upper logs. So, for instance, a, a factory grade number one log a butt can be 15 inches, 13 to 15 inches in diameter on the scaling end, which is diameter, where if it's an upper, it might have to be 16 to 20 inches in diameter log grade. Log length is also a function because the way knots lay out in the board, the way defects lay out in the board, we have to have a certain length of lumber in order to get the grades of log we have. And so length of logs becomes a grading issue that we have to think about. Clear cuttings are the condition expressed in the surface of the log. And we'll look a little bit at clear cuttings here. And sweep and crook are, are obvious kinds of things. That's the bend or disfigurement of logs in the tree. And in, in this picture here, we can even see in this uh, one log in the front, uh, we can see some sweep in it. So those are the kinds of things we have to think about because those are scaling deductions that as we put the log on the sawmill, we have more slabbing, we have loss volume. Then end defects are the kinds of things that we see at the, uh, at the end of the log that interpret the interior quality of the log, maybe showing us hollows, splits, uh, decay, discoloration, um, mural stains, and things. Now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna visit each most of these except for sweep and crook and scaling deductions so that we begin to think about how we look at that tree standing in the woodlot and use that information to start making decisions forward in our operation. This schematic of a tree helps us understand how as trees grow we accumulate clear volume of wood without defects on the outside of a core we look at this, we can see uh, down here at the stump how the pith sort of originates. And as the tree grows, limbs die and are covered over by an accumulation of subsequent diameter increments that enclose heartwood or defects. And so it's pretty easy to understand from this picture how the butt log have more clear wood in it than subsequent upper logs. And, and I think that's a good thing to keep in mind, and we'll come back to this a couple times as we develop, develop the talk. Grading faces are, are those faces that we see around the circumference of the log. And in grading faces, we take the circumference and divide it into four equal parts, 25% of the, grade, or the circumference. And the, the idea here is as you look at the logs and you lay on those faces to try to put the most, most of the defects in a single face. Look at the face that's labeled X. We see that there are any number of defects uh, on, on this log. I mean, there, in this face, there's a defect here, 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 here. Uh, because that is not the face we look at as we consider the value or the quality of the log. It's actually the second worst face, or the, the third worst face, or the second best face that, that is graded. And so that's the one that's labeled here as number two. Here we can see a few defects uh, that are going to influence the grade. The, the two better faces are not considered in the grading process. So. What you have to do is you have to learn to walk up to that log and think about how that's going to be interpreted in, in quality inside. Uh, Bob's asking about uh, what manual we're using. Uh, when we get to the end, I'll give you a site 
a uh, website where you can download some materials for log grading, standing tree grading, so that you can begin to understand this a little bit more clearly. Right now, we're just sort of laying out some general rules that we can think about. And, and the publications that I'll refer to at the end are printed by the U.S. Forest Service and available on a website. <clears throat> In this schematic, and we'll, we'll deal with only the one in the upper left, <clears throat> we see a 12-foot log with a scaling diameter of 14 inches. And in this, in this image, what we're doing is looking at how the placement of defects subsequently affects the, the potential board yield. In the first location, uh, we have board A that would come out of that. And this board yields first and second lumber, which is the highest grade, principally because these defects are located in the center and we still end up with enough clear surface in that board, which in FAS has to be 90% clear, to yield ourselves a high quality board. If we move those knots just to the right a bit, they begin to influence the value of this board that's out of the log because they've driven a large percentage of the surface measure of the board into one common. And because that's used up in one common, left-hand side, give us high quality. That becomes an issue. However, if we can move those defects all the way to the end of the log, what we yield is FAS lumber because of what's called the end of foot rule. Defects at the end of the board and it doesn't go against us. So it's not only recognizing defects, but understanding how the placement of those defects in the tree and how we buck and take the log from the tree will influence our ability to log. Again, our intent is not to make you log graders, but to get you to think about how these things work. Ultimately, if we've got low quality logs, this is low quality lumber. And in the, in the development of a stand, taking low quality lumber is, is to our benefit. What we have to do is start to think about how do we recognize the trees we want to move forward in the development of the stand, and how do we recognize the trees that we don't want to move forward. And then the other way, the other issue that we want to look at is the end of the log. Uh, in the schematic on the right, or the log on the right, we can see four of defects. You can see the pith here center of the log, and we can see that we're going to yield some low quality material, principally because of the fact that it's going to have a lot of deep around it. Uh, here on the right of the left, we can see that that's called the heart center zone, and around that are higher quality zones that, that we have to think about, and those are the kinds of things that we want to maximize, to make decisions about which tree. Pete, we're, we're still getting questions about sound. Is there anything we can do? Coming through for you. Turn up the mic a little bit. Is that any better? I turned up the volume on it some. Um, but it is. I'm not sure. Um, I, it's coming through for me. I mean, your your voice fades in and out well, a little bit. Sometimes. Again, you know, so it's coming back to the idea that we're trying and, to accumulate uh, make sure high quality project, lumber. You know, if you can, if you can do that, do that. And so the sooner we can if clean a, up a log, the volume, the surface defects, limbs, not, uh, limbs okay. fall well, off. Okay. Well, that'll. It'll work. I mean, it's defects it's, associated with that. And I, can, I, can, I can hear it. Lumber, it's, the higher um, the value, but the your the, the volume does fade a little bit. Or, or volume in it. And also, the bigger the log, the easier it is to move it into higher grade, higher grade markets. So, in thinking about that, uh, we begin to we begin to understand that how the stand develops affects the ability of that tree to. Uh, High quality material, and so what I'm going to want to do is think about a couple of things. 
One is the idea of shade tolerance. Trees that are shade tolerant tend to hold onto their branches longer than she trees that are shade intolerant. Uh, and so the longer they hold on branches, the more likely those are to become defects. And the less clear wood I'll ultimately be on top of those as a tree expands in diameter. And if we think about it, those trees that are listed here as intermediate and some of the trees that are listed as intolerant, particularly black cherry and yellow poplar, relatively high value market trees, red oak, white oak, ash, basswood, compared to some of the things that we see in the more tolerant listing, which generally has a little bit lower value because they can't yield as much. As we think about stand development, we begin to understand that trees that are shade intolerant or intermediate in shade tolerance generally try to occupy the upper canopy structure. And they have to in order to stay in the stand as it develops. And so if we look to the stand, and in this case we have black birch, red oak, and red maple, we would see that those trees occupy at the same age different places in the structure. If they start off at the same time, red oak will likely dominate in that stand. The others will be subservient. We can see that in another schematic, if we look at this from Oliver and Larson, where we look at a stand that developed in 1911 and we follow its progression through 1971 and 16 growth, we see that, that the, the red maple and the black birch are subservient to the red oak. Then once red oak gets the upper crown position, tends to widen its crown and spread it out and occupy that upper growing space. So if we want to grow certain species or we want to move particular individuals up, we need to be thinking about the competition that occurred in the canopy structure. And we have to think about what species we want to move forward and how we, moving those trees forward, we take the growth that occurs on an acre, put it on the trees that we want to retain as residuals. So we're always looking at that canopy relative to the quality of the trees that we're growing and thinking about how we take the growth and put it on the trees that we want. Ultimately, growth is fixed. We can't change the volume accumulation in a stand very much, but what we can do is put it on desirable individuals. So there, here, coming up as a series of pictures uh, that help us look at how stand development occurs and to think a little bit about the idea that mortality is a natural part of the process. And in the management decisions, we want to make choices about which trees have potential, which trees represent the quality of the site and the potential quality for future markets, and make decisions about who lives and who dies. Uh, the first image, this image is in 1927, and this is a clear cut. Saw logs have been removed. 1928, we've taken the chemical wood out of this stand. You see it piled behind the man standing there in the picture. And the regeneration is already in place. The stand will develop over the next 70 years and we'll be able to follow individual trees. Um, here we begin to see a couple things. Um, there's a black cherry, and over here's a black cherry, and behind it there's an aspen, which we'll see later. And in the foreground, we have some sugar maple. And we're going to follow those individuals and think about how competition affects it and how we might either make decisions or influence the process of this. Um, somehow I've missed a picture in here. We're now 20 years into stand development. Oh, I guess, yeah, that's right, 1937, 1937. And we can pick up uh, the sugar maple or the black cherry. We've got a black cherry. Back here is the aspen foreground here is some sugar maple. And we can see scatterings of other trees throughout the picture, but recognize that these are all the same age. You saw where they originated. And there's competition happening. At the previous picture, um, the previous picture, what we had was um, um, stem exclusion had occurred. There was no light hitting the forest floor. And at that point, we were probably losing trees at a rate of 4 or 5% a year. In other words, 4 or 5% of the total trees on the site 
dying at this point in the stand development, we're probably losing 2% or so of the trees per year. Mortality is a natural part of the process because for individual trees to continue to grow, they have to be able to expand the crown. Bill's asking about uh, chestnut. Well, this particular stand, Bill, was up on the Allegheny Plateau in the Allegheny National Forest, and chestnut was not a major component of that stand. And uh, it, uh, it wasn't one that came in in the stand. Um, 1958, we can start to pick out individual trees, and we can start to see differentiation in diameter. Uh, in the foreground, we still got our, our black cherry, black cherry, aspen, sugar maple. Black cherry in the foreground is larger. You see sugar maple leaves in the more structure, and so sugar maple being more shade tolerance hanging in. And we can begin to look at the surface, say, of the sugar maple and the effects there, while the surface on this black cherry is starting to clean up. So if we were looking at this at this point in stand development, we might say, well, what can I do to benefit these two trees, uh, front two black cherries? It may be the expense of the aspen. Sugar maples are probably in subservient crown positions. 1968, we're 40 years into stand development. Uh, we can put the black cherry in the foreground. Well, the one next to it is not keeping up. The aspen is still hanging in the sugar maple. And it's pretty hard to pick out some of the same similar species in the background. 50 years into stand development, aspen has fallen out. Back to start to see the age structure and the competition there. So we can look up into the canopy and we can see the hole that's been created by that. Black cherry here is likely to have better advantage because it's shade intolerant and still in the canopy as compared to the sugar maple here, which you can still see some defects on the stem, where this one's starting to clean up, and this is a really nice looking cherry log at this point. 70 years in, or 60 years into stand development, we can see the response of the black, black cherry to the rear. Sugar maple were still relatively small. Then we go into the, the last picture in this series, and we can see that two black cherries have started to become closer to diameter. Sugar maple still in the background, uh, hasn't developed a nice clean bowl yet. Black cherries are doing pretty well. And one would say, well, if I was going to grow quality here, which one of these is going to be the better stem? Well, this has accumulated lots of clear wood at this point relative to this one. So this one's starting to catch up. And so if I had opportunities to make decisions, while this is the larger tree, I may actually decide to keep it take the smaller tree to provide it more crown space. So individual tree decisions begin to happen at this point in stand development, and you're thinking about quality, you're thinking about species, and you're thinking about where those trees are each other. So it brings you to the idea of the role of cutting, because it's really through the process of cutting trees you begin to influence how that stand development's gonna happen, and it's really about how we can make decisions about where we're gonna Cutting as a process removes competition. It takes away trees that are in competition with each other. Say, the, if we look at the picture to the right here, uh, we've got a red oak, and we can see that the crown on it is being interfered by this red maple in below it. And so we've got competition taking place. And I could look at the species. I could look at the crown condition, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. And I could think about what my market values are, the quality of my sites, and make some decisions about which one of these trees I want to grow. And by cutting, say, maybe the red maple, I begin to control light and how light's going to affect the crown development of this tree and allow it to take the growth that occurs over here and capture that in its own biomass and it log. This red oak here has got a nice crown already, and it's not in competition with any of the adjacent trees. And so Maybe I don't have to do any work around that tree. Ultimately, I have to think about how we are, I redistribute growth. As I said earlier, growth is fixed on any given site. Uh, if I look at the average site in Pennsylvania, it's about 250, 300 board feet per acre per year. I can put that across 
a thousand trees or I can put it across a hundred trees depending on where I am in stand development and how I want to do things and I can accumulate a valuable crop. I can control through cutting species composition and species composition is certainly something I want to think about. Ultimately I have set objectives in the case of this evening we're thinking about how our objectives management strategies affect our ability to value. Uh, Bob's asked the question about um, growth rings and is there a, a difference in, in value associated with growth rings. When we're talking about veneer quality material, uh, Bob, there are some issues associated with too rapid a growth. Um, it's not often though that you see that that in decision is from my experience. If we're moving into the European market, uh, for instance, the German market, and I see there's someone here from Germany tonight. Uh, there are some considerations about the width of rings in the German forest. They actually try to control for very narrow rings because that's what the foresters want to grow. But when they've done market studies with the consumers, they actually like wider rings. So I don't think we need to um, affect that too much. Bob also raises the question, will releasing trees affect the quality? And there is always that potential that when I release a tree, one of the biggest degraders might be the formation of epicormic branches in response to increased light and heat, which is sort of a small branch that develops on the side of the tree, which can be a, a great defect. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. As we do. Yeah, white oak is bad for that, Bob. And we have to think about that all the time with white oak. Um, silviculture is really what we're beginning to think about here, and silviculture is the theory, i.e. the science, and the practice, the art, of positively controlling forest establishment, composition, structure, and growth. And I've put the, the point positively in here because it's really about trying to move the stand forward in a positive kind of way. Some things that we do, silviculture, under the name of silviculture, don't positively Stance development, and we, we have to think about it. Particularly, we're thinking about high-quality hardwood production, about doing things that move the stand forward. Put establishment in the definition, or foresters put establishment in the definition, because almost every time we enter a forest, and particularly a hardwood forest, into the conditions we're growing them today, we have to think about the next forest. We're always thinking about the species composition structures the, the vertical and horizontal arrangement of the trees and ultimately the growth of the residual forest. Well, we can sort of simplify the idea of silviculture to two components. Um, and in my mind, anyhow, I do. And, and one is what you leave from any kind of harvesting operation. Uh, and that's the residual. And then the other side of it is the regeneration. And so the residual actually drives the regeneration because it leaves the seed source and the potential for tomorrow. You always got to be thinking about that. We'll come back to that in a few minutes. Um, but if you look at the picture on the left, it's the quality of the trees that we leave that are going to go forward and where our future economic potential is. So when we look at growing quality, and our focus is on retention. There are a couple things we need to think about. Um, one is what is the quality of the site? What's the potential of that site to grow the species that are either there or the species we want to grow? How do we maintain enough diversity to have resilience in that form? For instance, uh, this afternoon we talked about emerald ash borer and emerald ash borer affecting the quality of the potential of that. We have to think about that diversity question. And we have to think about markets, and I've already sort of touched on that, in that if we produce quality material, I think the market potential is going to be there. There's always the potential of fluctuation in that market. Fortunately, with trees, we don't always have to cut them at a given time. We can work the markets to our advantage. We have to think about the condition of the tree, and we talked about that from the idea of the quality of the stem. Uh, and the idea that log grades fit into that. We also have to think about the quality or the condition of that tree relative to the canopy structure. What does that canopy look like? Uh, how how healthy is it? 
how good is the crown, what's the placement of the crown, and how do we manage that, which comes down to the idea of competition. Because ultimately, we're thinking about how trees compete for the growing space to expand their crown. And then finally, we have to sort of think about the risks. Um, when we look at that tree, what's the potential of that tree being able to grow forward in the stand as it develops and stay in the stand? What's the risk we're going to lose if we move the stand and stay in the stand? So as you look at this picture of this forest, I hope you're starting to think a little bit about what things you see here and, and what things you don't see here. You know, obviously, to me, this stand appears to be fairly well stocked, if not overstocked. I see some pretty high quality trees. I see a black cherry and a four red oak a little back in, a uh, red maple in the foreground, a black cherry with a crotch in it, and there are no softwoods in this. <laughs> uh, Bob asked about that. So, you know, you're starting to look at it, and then I start to look at the surface of them, and then if I were in the stand, I'd be looking up in the canopy, and I'd be thinking about the kinds of defects and the risk and the species and all right, when we look at tree condition, uh, you can begin to classify things. Common classification, acceptable growing stock, and unacceptable growing stock. Uh, acceptable growing stock is the kinds of things that we want to move forward. And the US Forest Service, in defining this, talks about a minimum log grade potential. And their response is that we want to have at least a grade two potential is sort of the middle of the road because there are three factory grades. And we want a likelihood of it surviving from one entry to the next entry. So we have to be thinking about what's the potential of that tree staying alive and continuing to grow and produce lumber, and what is its relationship to those others? Is it related to an unacceptable growing stock? If I want to take the unacceptable and leave the acceptable, because it comes back to growing the residual. Now, I, that brings me to the garden analogy because I, I like a garden analogy because it, it allows us to think about sort of the activities of forestry relative to a shorter term crop. And when we think about growing a crop, we think about what we want to grow, the species, we want to grow quality. And in order to grow quality, we have to weed, in other words, take out those things that are either poor quality species we don't want to grow and we want to think about thinning that in order to put the growth on the things that we do want to grow. Favorite analogy here are carrots and how many of us have ever grown little carrots and nothing but little carrots principally because we don't have the gumption or the, the confidence to thin those carrots to remove the competition even if all we have is carrots. Um, and what you're managing here most of the time in that garden is are the light resources some extent the moisture resource. If you look in that forest canopy, we're managing the same kinds of things, principally light, to some extent water and maybe to some extent nutrients. But in, in the Northeast, a lot of it just comes back to the amount of light we can put on the trees and protect the light. So you have to be thinking about ground position, you have to be thinking about the quality of the tree. So here we begin to see some of these common kinds of defects. Uh, the tree on the left uh, got a logging injury. That indicates that we've got a, a center, a center that's subjected to rot potentially. How large is that rot? Does it extend into the core uh, beyond the core? Does it occupy more than 40% of the diameter? If it does, well then that's going to really be a significant defect. Here, here we have a frost crack. Frost crack, maybe we can put it on the great on the on the worst face, and maybe the tree grades out pretty well. But there are questions about how far that extends into the tree. Here obviously we've got a really degraded tree, maybe from a lightning strike, we have a bump. And so when you start to see these and have a knowledge about how they open up when we open the sawmill and about that begin to give us some indications of things we have to think about. Um, yes, it does describe uh, what makes a grade two and also what makes a grade three log. You know, and as you're walking through the forest and you're thinking about the trees you're going to keep or the trees that you might uh, 
discriminate against, you know, obvious defects are things like holes, uh, poor crotches. Uh, this is a black cherry that's got uh, miles of crotch in it. If we had any kind of wind loading or snow loading or ice loading, that's certainly one that's going to be at risk of losing a portion of its crown. Uh, I had a really nice red oak this spring out in the woodlot I managed for the university. They had a crotch like this that I hadn't paid a lot of attention to. And uh, basically half the tree came down. And so I've got a pretty decent butt log. I don't have a market for it. I probably should have taken it out years ago. And we got some decent firewood out of the side that came down. Uh, would I remove these kinds of trees as soon as they become apparent? Um, probably I wouldn't enter a stand until I probably had five or so inches of diameter growth. That way they begin to express some of their crown dominance. And you have to be careful coming into a stand too early, Tim, in that if you come in too early, you may have a tendency to keep the logs too short. Uh, the crowns get too wide. When the crowns get too wide and they're short, we get more butt swelling. We get more tapering. It's nice to allow the tree to be able to elongate under some competition. I might identify the trees that I want to move forward early on in the development and do some light thinning around them. And I think the important thing is to identify the trees you want to keep and then discriminate against the trees you want to take out of the stand. Identifying keepers, taking out losers. And, and doing that in as sort of early as you can and as cautiously as you can, they begin to express crown dominance pretty nicely and then you can work aggressively. You know, if, if we look at a stand as it develops, the average hardwood tree is about 14 inches in diameter. We're going to be looking at about 100, 120 trees to the acre. And so we might start with 40,000, and by the time it gets to that diameter of 14 inches, we're down to 100, 120. You've got to lose a lot of trees. So, yeah, you can be thinking about this all the time. And, and you're keeping yourself some options open, not bringing it down to some little that made some sense. And here we see some other defects on, on trees. We've got a red maple here with a number of bumps, uh, whatnot. We've got a clump of red maple over here. None of them are particularly clear. Uh, these trees were about 12, 14 inches in diameter. They're in competition with each other. We've got low quality material. You know, could we have done something early, maybe take two of these off, allow this one to accumulate in diameter more quickly? Could we have taken, uh, had this been a good tree, could we have taken the epicormic branch off of it before it got large? I think that's something that we really ought to think about. Oftentimes in something like a shelter wood where we've gone in and begun to prepare a stand for regeneration, we leave high quality trees evenly spaced and it develops an epicormic branch, say that white oak that was mentioned earlier, and we sort of let it go. We let it get bigger and we say, dang, it got a, an epicormic branch on it. Where we could have taken it off when it formed relatively easily and the defect would have been small and may, maybe not even scaled out. We need to think about those kinds of things. We see some additional defects in, in these pictures. We've got ice damage in the top of a black cherry. Certainly not a tree I'd want to carry forward. I've got a black cherry with quite a bit of sweep in it. Remember that when we're bucking this up, we may be able to cut some of that sweep out. And if it has clear surface, that might work to clean it. Here we have some of those white oak with epicormic branches on it. Um, come back to the, the, there you go. Thanks, Jim. Let's just talk quickly about stand development and think about how we make some decisions about thinning. And, and how in a mixed species stand, we might thin that stand benefit of quality. Here we have a single species stand. You might, it might be a pine plantation. It might be a black cherry stand. It might be a red oak stand dominated by a single species. Solid line curve represents pre-thinning pre stand distribution. We've got a lot of trees around the average. We've got relatively few large trees, relatively few small trees. Uh, in thinning, we would tend to cut heavier in the smaller diameters, cut some of the large trees because there's obviously going to be competition there. And in that process, we actually move the average stand diameter forward. And by doing that, we've kept the best trees. 
to put put those in the situation to accumulate the volume that's going to come onto the site and, and actually grow them at a faster rate. And so we sort of extrapolate that idea to a mixed species stand, and you may not have recognized this kind of a stand in the woods, and you may have seen it and said, well, it's a it's a, an uneven aged forest. But if we actually look at the, the diameter distributions of individual species based on tolerance, where black cherry is the least shade tolerant, sugar maple the most shade tolerant, we may actually see, if we measured the plots or measured the trees out, that we have different distributions for each one of these species, and they overlap with each other. And, and so what we do is we think about how we might treat each one of these species distributions in a thinning operation to improve residual stand structure. And we'll see how that's done in a couple minutes. We look up into the canopy. We think about where individual trees are in competition with each other, how they each define their own crown space as they begin to move around and are in competition with each other. And think about how we can create more opportunity, say, for this yellow poplar here by taking this one off the side. A lot of decisions are made up there, but also made in, in itself. And so we need to be looking down at the, um, at the stems, uh, recognizing that a lot of stems are going to die and which ones are in competition with one forward. How can we begin over time to thin this stand, moving ourselves toward higher quality individuals all the time? You know, this one goes to this one back here. Until ultimately, in an even age stand, we've gone from something like this, something like the stand on the right, where we've got a lot of high quality residual stems. And, you know, we're going to have to be thinking about how we're going to regenerate this at some point. That's another discussion altogether. So in these stands, what we're actually doing is we're thinning each one of these species distributions. We've got a sugar maple distribution here. Thin down to here. We've cut some in the upper diameter classes, the same thing with the white ash, and the same thing with the black ash. And overall, we reduce the total numbers of trees, and you can imagine what that does in the canopy structure. And we've taken out trees of lesser quality, trees that are in competition with one another. So we begin to have a stand that looks something like this. And we can see that we've still got some trees to remove, but overall, uh, we've we've kept some pretty nice individuals. And one of the things I noticed about this stand that I hadn't noticed before is that these trees are marked to save. See, there's blue lines on them. Everything that wasn't marked to save was taken. Even this one back here, I think, has a blue line on it. Unfortunately, one of the things that we often see happen in stands across the Northeast is we take this diameter distribution that we just saw a minute ago and we impose a diameter restriction on it and we cut all trees above a certain diameter. We can see immediately what happens here. We simplify species composition by taking a species out of it. We take the better half of the diameter distribution of ash and leave the worst half, leave ourselves an understory of sugar maple. Well, sugar maple may be a good thing to leave on that site. Then again, it may not be. Unfortunately, at least in Pennsylvania, we, Pennsylvania, we see that maybe as many as 50% of our timber sales are driven by diameter limit decisions. So we're seeing shifting in species composition, composition, we're seeing loss of seed sources, and so we have all kinds of things come into effect that we need to start to think about. Um, yeah, we we would. Uh, Ralph's raising a question about the basal area in that stand. Yeah, we would be want to watch the basal area, and I don't recall what the basal area was in that stand. We'd probably, that was an oak stand, I'd want to be carrying probably 60 or 70 square feet of basal area. And it may have been under that at that point. Important thing is um, that, that we've got to remember that in many of the stands we look at, you know, in southern New England, Pennsylvania and different places throughout the north central area region that diameter is not indicative of age. If we think back to that series of slides we just looked at on the development of that stand on the Allegheny National Forest, those trees were all the same age and it was clear that we had different diameter distributions. 
or um, we had we had different we had constant age structure, uh, but different diameter distributions. And in this case here, we've got two trees in a woodlot I managed for the university. These trees in the in the picture were uh, 64 years of age. We've got the one that I'm holding up over here on the right. Uh, it was 11.8 inches in diameter in 1985. This red oak here was 20 inches in diameter in 1985. Last summer, this tree, 11.9 inches. This one was 31. If we'd done a diameter distribution, this tree would have disappeared a long time ago. This would have been the one left. And, and oftentimes, those trees don't respond well to the heavy thinning or heavy cutting. And we often see degrades uh, show up in the form of epicormic branches, old trees, a lot of mortality. The trees aren't set up to handle, handle those kinds of things. This stand doesn't look too bad if you, if you looked at it, but if you're an astute observer, this is a stand that's been high graded repeatedly. Back here, we got a black cherry, and I believe there's another black cherry here. Everything else in this picture is American beech. That's a pretty large, low quality American beech. Here's one here that's not too bad. You know, tr allowing these kinds of things to happen uh, by indiscriminately taking the better quality trees out sort of sets up what Roach and Gingrich are saying here that um, if we treat a stand poorly, eventually we're going to have to make investments to get the right kind of outcomes. And um, you know, it's much easier to, to think this through from the, at the onset and think about the idea of quality and how we're going to get reproduction and how we're going to manage the residual trees to move it forward. This is a, an idea that came out of Susan Stout in the Northeast Station uh, based on some research we did in the, in the mid-90s. Uh, this is the acid test, and, and foresters are not well known for their ability to spell acid. What we want you to always think about when you're working in a stand, beyond the idea of quality, where is advanced regeneration? Have you left the seed source for desirable species? Regardless of what your intent is, every time you enter the stand, you have to think about it. What's the role of interfering plants relative to that regeneration? And in the Northeast, you have to think about white-tailed deer as well. So consider the acid test. And even if you're all you're thinking about is going into a forest in, in doing an improvement cut or thinning it, whatever terms you want to use, you're always setting up the processes for natural regeneration, whether it's an uneven age forest or an even age forest. You're, you're managing this thing in a way that you're affecting light, managing what's left, not managing the trees that you've cut, but the trees that are original. And so you always have to think about the question of sustainability as well as the quality of the tree. So in summary, as you're looking at a forest and you're thinking about managing it, using harvesting as a tool to grow high quality trees, consider your species, conditions of those trees, look at how competition is affecting the trees that you want to grow forward, evaluate the risk of individual trees you want to move forward, stance development, based on the kinds of things we talked about relative to quality. Look at the residuals that you're going to leave. Think about always how regeneration is going to occur. Um, that sort of wraps up the presentation. And, and as I promised, I've got a couple resources here. Uh, the, one on, the ones on log grading, uh, this one here particularly, a guide to hardwood log grading um, by RAST at all. Sonderman was another author on it. That was printed, I think, in 1973. And it's a real good reference to look at to try to understand uh, hardwood log grades. It'll break down the basic elements of it. All deductions are done. And it'll link it into some other kinds of things. Uh, Pete just put the website up for it. The website's also on this image. Um, the other one is, is a lumber from local woodlots, which is an NRAISE publication out of Cornell. If you just type NRAISE into Google, you'll end up on that site. That's a for sale publication. It's designed more for, uh, for uh, homeowners, people who may 
live in residential areas, but it also gives you some real good insights on how to handle lumber, how to make some decisions about harvesting trees and dealing with them. I've put up our website here, uh, the publication that we encourage you to look at relative to hardwood lumber or log production. It's our Pennsylvania Forest Stewardship Bulletin number seven. And if you go to that site and look at publications, you'll find that publication. And then I put my contact information up here as well. Good, Pete. Okay, that, that sort of wraps up the formal presentation, and, and uh, I think there was one question about the Mid-Coast Maine. Uh, I think uh, some of the Mid-Coast Maine has the same kind of stand structures that we have even down here where I am. Um, trying to think about I some just, of the woodlots I worked up in there. Uh, saw a lot of stone. I, I was just going to say, I opened uh, your website and the, uh, the tree search site in the background so for all the had some questions, so that should be... In. Um, and that should be if if if, uh, if you look at your web browser, that those should be opened up right now. Let's just talk about the timing, Pete. <laughs> Thanks, Pete. Yep. Great. Well, while people are thinking and typing their questions, let me bring up our third and final poll. And folks can please take just a minute to respond to that. Jim, you gave another great presentation right on time. I am Stand so impressed thin. with uh, uh, your timing on this and 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 the the you know the the content that you're able to cover in that amount of time. Well, you know, there's there. No, you know, on. ideally, when oh, you're yeah, thinning a clump of trees, um, stump I, I learned something. I, you know, I, and, um, I think about this stuff. You know, a lot of pretty people in the basis, past have looked at stump sprout development and scants. Noon and the season, it doesn't so yield high quality I appreciate stuff. that. So while yeah, you know, you're, and you're, and we've looked at that question here. To the survey, um, you can also be thinking in about Pennsylvania, the particularly in oak stands. Questions and it may be seven or eight percent. Had a couple one on stems we see. In some stands, could be stump sprout or stem thin on the undergrowth. If I were going to do on, stump um, how many or stems sprout removal on stumps, I would probably thin. want to do it before they're say five inches in diameter, six inches in diameter. Uh, Jim responded that you would take it down to one. Uh, I generally say you could take it down to two. You can take it ideally down to one, but if you have two that you're going to try to carry. Oh, no, forward, I'm sorry. Generally, oh, okay. You do that. Go ahead. You want them to be as low on the stump as possible at their point of origin. Uh, that being that as they grow out, uh, they'll develop a U crotch at the bottom, bottom rather than a V crotch. That U crotch indicates that you don't have joined pith, and so you treat those as individuals rather than a single tree, and you can cut one and leave it. Uh, and that would be in, in anything that we any species you want, want to deal with relative to that. Um, German foresters talk constantly about undergrowth, encouraged to shade the crop tree stems. Um, I've been in Germany twice and had the opportunity to look at culture and development. They certainly tend to carry a lot more stocking than we do. A lot of it is, originates from planting. Uh, I've seen them already plant on meter by meter centers with the idea of carrying this stuff forward so that the, the oak only is grown at about a sixteenth of an inch per year in stem diameter uh, and carrying beech in the understory for shading. Uh, I think if you, um, I don't think that that's necessary. We haven't seen it in our research. On I, I don't get particularly excited about it. It seems like it's quite an investment to carry. I'm, I'm not motivated to do that. Um, Bob's asking a question about 
uh, reducing mineral stain, uh, mineral stain in red oak. I don't know that I can address that particular question. Never thought a whole lot about it, and um, what I have heard about it, it generally relates to site conditions. So uh, I don't know that there's anything so culturally. Um, well, that's an interesting question, Bob, about the hemlocks as uh, trainers. And, you know, that comes back to the idea of, of reducing epicormics, uh, maybe shoving them into, into higher, higher height classes on the hardwoods. Uh, my wife and I have a, a property in north central Pennsylvania. We've got some red oak uh, surrounded by, by hemlock. And um, they've got some nice bowls, but I suspect they would have had pretty nice bowls without the, the hemlock. Um, however, I'm going to take advantage of the hemlock this fall or this summer, we've got a phenomenal oak seed crop, at least here in central Pennsylvania. And I'm eager to get up into the northern part of the state and see if we have the same kind of thing there. If we do, my intent is to fell a lot of the hemlock around the red oak, create a uh, deer fence. Maybe I can capture some of that red oak seed source. Because red oak really only seeds about every four to 12 years here where we are. And so I'd love to be able to capture that seed on the forest floor and start to set myself up for stand development. Um, what else we got here, Pete? We Trainer trees would be ones that would be coming in underneath the canopy of the tree that I want to grow. Uh, sort of the German kind of an idea keeping shade on the stem, uh, putting the crown in competition and moving it up uh, because they would sort of be coming in below and forcing forcing the uh, trees above them to continue to move up. That's kind of the way I would interpret it. Might add something to it if you see something. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, subsidies uh, in maybe Germany. Maybe define yep. what trainer trees are? And hemlock has to be growing on the south side of the red oak tree. Um, what do you mean by that, Bob? Yeah, yeah. The um, the whole Bob's just brought up the point about uh, uh, mid-level trees that might be in a stand. There's an important ecological thing to always think about. We look at light. A higher light, a higher shade is in the canopy, less dense it is. Because the size of the sun and the rays coming coming from that big orb in the sky actually allows light to move past the leaf surface. And our pie will get some information past it. As shade gets closer to the forest floor, like witch hazel, hophorn beam, striped maple, beach brush, those kinds of things, that light is close to the forest ferns. That's a very, very dense shade, and it also has relatively poor light quality. So you always have to think about low shade, particularly as it relates to regeneration. So that's something to think about. Yeah, I, uh, Bob's raising the point that the hemlock on the south side would be a better trainer than a hemlock on the north side, for sure. Um, I think in this case, I'm going to have enough hemlock left that I'm not going to worry about it either way. <laughs> but that's a good point. Jim, uh, Mike Morrison is asking a question about 
uh, suggestions on how to protect hardwood trees from gnawing animals in the winter time, and, and I've wondered if Mike bird. can clarify that. If that's those are, I'm assuming those are forest um, trees, and I guess the next question would be if he knows what those gnawing animals. Okay, I was are. looking for the, the the answer from Mike, and I, I didn't see it yet. Um, uh, Bob raises another the, the question. Two, the two no things that I've seen uh, damaging hardwoods the are deer, bucks the rubbing their antlers the on saplings, and the other one is porcupines. Um, uh, it depends on the site. Unless seedling um, sizes, and then... I've, I've got red oak I manage uh, for the university that doesn't have any competition around it other than oh, right. hardwoods. There's some superior quality there. Some of the sites we're working on for the Bureau of Forestry and a long-term regeneration site project we have, we have almost no conifers in those stands and we grow some superior red oaks. I don't know whether I make that linkage entirely, but uh, red oak and, and hemlock are often associated in issues. Uh, Tim Davis noticed that a lot of the pictures I had didn't have a lot of understory. Uh, that relates a lot of times to the white-tailed deer in Pennsylvania. Although where you saw cutting, relatively fresh cutting, obviously we had taken understory structure out uh, in the harvesting activity. But uh, a lot of times we just don't have much happening on the forest floor other than those things that deer will eat. You might recall that there was a picture of uh, some black cherry uh, in a series of four, and, and the only thing grown in the understory was ferns. Um, you mentioned harvesting before a tree degrades. How can I recognize this? Um, I was talking about there the idea that that you know a tree, trees do reach f physiological maturity, and it's not common that you're going to grow a tree to, to physiological maturity. You're likely to take it to some sort of economic maturity. Um, some of the work that's been done by the Allegheny or the Northeast Forest Experiment Station would suggest in hardwood stands that when we start to have average stand diameter approaching 18 inches, uh, we're probably reaching the point where uh, we've sort of reached economic maturity. Uh, the rate of mortality is going to start to be so high that it's going to offset our growth rate. Because if, we, if I've got an average stand di diameter of 18 inches, I'm probably only carrying in, say, an oak stand uh, 60 stems. So if I lose one of 60 stems that year, I've lost a significant amount of money. So can you recognize it? No, I think you have to sort of be paying attention to how the stand's moving forward. So, old potato field. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, Mike's raising a question about trying to grow hardwoods in, in old field sites. Um, that's always a challenge. And a couple things to think about there. Uh, one is to reduce the, the grass cover uh, in the stand, in the field. Uh, mowing is probably pretty expensive, but herbicide applications, at least to, uh, in probably in bands, Around the trees in the rows would be, be advantageous if it's natural regeneration making some decisions about which trees you want to sort of protect and, and removing vegetation around them could be helpful um, I would also consider ways that I might put perches in the stand or in the field encourage things that might mice like hawks and raptors owls Box, those kinds of things that would be particularly uh, hard on probably meadow bowls rather than mice. Um, there are opportunities to bait uh, these same species, and I'm not up to date on the kinds of baits and the legalities of doing that. Um, black ash, uh, I have no knowledge of black ash that I can call at this point. Except that silvix wise, black ash is a species that's associated with wetter sites. And 
I'd be looking for the sites that had the seed source and the potential to grow it, but I don't know anything about it. I know that white ash is relatively shade intolerant early in its stand initiation, but its tolerance shifts as it matures, and by the time it's about five or six inches in diameter, it is pretty shade intolerant. I would suggest that you would check the silvix of North American trees, uh, which you can locate on Tree Search, which is the U.S. Forest Service website. Uh, Bob's raising a question about scarification uh, for regeneration. That's an interesting uh, question, and it's one that we've been trying to look at with some of our regeneration work uh, here in Pennsylvania. It's interesting about red oak. Red oak, if you've ever looked at the timing of acorn drop, uh, it'll drop its acorns before it drops its leaves. And so it tends to self-bury its acorns. Now, if you can get those acorns a little deeper, scarification or disturbance of the site, get them in contact with mineral soil, I think that's to your advantage. Um, maple, I'm not real familiar with. I know the red maple doesn't require much scarification. We see lots of germination of it. Sugar maple, I'm less familiar with. And black cherry has a seed easily into the leaf litter and doesn't seem to have any particular problems with getting buried. No understory have any effect, positive or negative, on the quality of trees. I don't think so. Um, you know, when it comes when it comes to looking at stand development and quality development, it's it's really where the crowns are in the stand structure and density, and you don't want to open it up too much too quickly. I touched on that earlier. Um, so you know, and and I don't think that it really has a, a lot of impact. Uh, it certainly is going to have impact on regeneration, but once I've got the stand established, I don't think that's a particular issue. As far as Bob's question about, or Bill's question about leaving um, hops in the stands and returning stuff to the, um, to the site, yeah, I think that's always a good idea. I try to encourage people to leave hops in a stand uh, because of the micronutrients associated with them. And uh, they do act as natural little barriers for because deer are feeders of opportunity. And it doesn't take a whole lot of slash to deter them sometimes from taking some of the things that I'd like to have. So hops are good. And they don't stick around long enough in a lot of, time, a lot of cases. Dave's raising questions about rubus or blackberries. Uh, I'm actually an uh, advocate for blackberries. I like to see blackberries occur in a stand. We've noticed, and it's been documented in the literature, that there's a influence of blackberries on ferns. And if I have blackberries come into a stand, they'll often exclude ferns. The other thing is that blackberries are preferred deer food. And if I get blackberries, then that often suggests that my deer densities may be low enough that I can establish regeneration. The other thing is that blackberries come into a stand immediately after disturbance, and they bind up some of the, the elements that would normally leach out of the stand and, and grab it and hold it. And then having biannual canes that die out relatively quickly, they're actually releasing that back into the site and recycling nutrients. And hardwood trees will come up through blackberries. And so there, there are all kinds of wonderful things associated with blackberries, not to mention, fail to mention pies and dumplings. <laughs> thanks for the opportunity, Pete, and thanks everybody for showing up.
Well, on that Jeez. note, let's. Um, I no, I agree. I I love uh, blackberry pie and blackberry jam, um, and and blackberry for all the reasons you mentioned as well. This is uh, Jim. You've done a wonderful job. I really appreciate the yeah, uh, time right. and effort you've put into this, and I. I Yes, I appreciate all the audience uh, sticking around. Those were some great questions. Um, and I'll look forward to seeing you all at uh, sunset here, in Pete. the future. So have a great evening. Uh, have fun in your woods. And uh, thanks again to Jim. Well, I'm looking to the west, and uh, the sun is going down over the ridge just in behind our house. I can see that ridge from you, uh, here. You stick around for just a minute, Jim? Just bright and red, streaming in the window. Gorgeous. <laughs> in the office. I had a uh, panic. Here. Heavy clouds. I went in and it, well, that and looking to the north. So. Is, and I couldn't get, uh, couldn't get a web link. So I finally had to go to. Uh, uh, Netscape, or not Netscape, it's the other one. Netscape doesn't exist anymore. You, uh, are you, are you coming 